following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. He just spiraled out of control. A mysterious illness. He needs to come to the ER right away. And these parents couldn't even recognize their four-year-old son. Something was seriously wrong with him and it was worse than we had thought. Their fight for a cure. I believe it's gonna get much worse before it gets better. In more ways than one. I feel like the very gates of hell have come against my child. Watch a dramatic recovery. Only God can make me better. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Tearing down statues, censoring movies, and banning books. Is this part of Nazi Germany? Or oh, no, it's part of the rising cancel culture movement sweeping America. And anyone who disagrees with what is deemed, quote, offensive, is scared into silence, hounded into submission, or fired. Dale Hurd has this disturbing story. The censors have come for the children's cartoon Paw Patrol, Gone with the Wind, Legos, the Cracker Barrel restaurant chain, and even a ride at Disney World called Splash Mountain, all in the name of trying to erase the culturally insensitive. It seems nothing is safe from the cancel culture movement. Hollywood stars have gone public to confess their supposed sins of ignoring racial injustice. I take responsibility. I take responsibility. They could also be trying to save their careers. A number of celebrities and corporate heads have already lost their jobs for alleged racism or cultural insensitivity. Even the editorial page editor of the liberal New York Times. Another casualty is the Church of the Highlands in Birmingham, Alabama, with 60,000 attendees. They will no longer be able to meet at local high schools after the pastor liked social media posts supporting President Trump and was declared culturally insensitive. Freedom of speech is continuing to lose ground in America to a kind of socially enforced groupthink. Saying the wrong thing or simply not saying anything could have the thought police deciding you're a bad person. The worst crimes are committed by people saving the world. David Horowitz, who led the 60s anti-war movement, says the difference between the Vietnam War protests and the George Floyd protests is that Black Lives Matter has real power to change America, thanks to the backing of the Democratic Party, corporate America, and the media. Yeah, I find this shocking I, that, that so many people cave into this. All the stupid apologies by people, uh, you know, and then Hollywood funding the looters. Who do you think is most hurt by these riots? Poor black people. Who's going to be hurt the most by defunding the police and tying their hands? Poor black people. People. Even some on the left are now alarmed by the censorship and firings. University of Pennsylvania professor Jonathan Zimmerman, a staunch opponent of President Trump, wrote in the Chicago Tribune that what he calls rituals of public humiliation are not accomplishing you know, um, anything. The irony of our moment is you find a lot of people saying, you know, we need an honest conversation about race but then essentially erecting barriers about what can be said on it. And that's not a formula for an honest conversation. When I asked Professor Zimmerman if America was headed into dangerous this territory, he replied, No, yeah, we're not headed towards it. We're in it. Like, like, this is not a journey. We've arrived, man. Zimmerman says America urgently needs a bipartisan movement to defend free speech. Before coming to Christ, political activist Tiana Elisara marched with the left against President Trump. All my life I was taught that, you know, there was someone holding me down, the system is against me. Now she hosts the Left the Left show on social media. Well, she says she understands the hearts of the protesters and those who are censoring. My heart is heavy because I know they have good intentions, but what I'm most sad about is that they are being grossly manipulated to fit someone's political agenda. America was founded on the principle of pluralism, the idea that different views are welcome. That America doesn't seem to exist anymore. Dale Hurd, CBN News. 
Can you imagine? They're even trying to hide a statue of Winston Churchill uh, in England. And Churchill, you know, mounted the, uh, the great attack against the Nazis. And even uh, Abraham Lincoln, there's a statue of him that's been defaced. Why? Because he was putting his hands tenderly on a black man, and they thought that was something wrong. Listen, 1984, George Orwell pre pre predicted what might happen when Big Brother had his way, and it looks like it's coming to pass in America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. We've got to watch it because your freedom matters a great deal. In another news, your loved ones will not have died in vain. That's the president's promise to families of victims who have suffered police brutality. John Jessup has more. Pat, Senate Republicans are set to release their police reform bill today in response to a recently passed House plan. Public protests and riots fueled by rage over police killings of black men is forcing Washington to take action. And President Trump offered his own solutions Tuesday. White House correspondent Ben Kennedy tells us more. The executive order addresses the ban on police chokeholds. President Trump said he spoke with faith leaders, members of law enforcement, and even the families of victims of excessive force. Their input helped shape the executive order. To all of the hurting families, I want you to know that all Americans mourn by your side. Your loved ones will not have died in vain. That step motivates police agencies nationwide to adopt best practices of use of force. It also requires sharing of information about officers who engage in misconduct. Nobody wants to get rid of them more than the overwhelming number of really good and great police officers. The executive order on safe policing for safe communities also launches a co-responder program where health and social workers would join officers on nonviolent calls. We will provide more resources for co-responders, such as social workers who can help officers manage these complex encounters. In the wake of George Floyd's death, the order even addresses knee on neck and chokeholds. Chokeholds will be banned, except if an officer's life is at risk. Critics maintain the executive order doesn't go far enough. Reverend Al Sharpton calls it toothless, tweeting, we don't need studies, we need police that commit crimes to be punished. All police that use chokeholds claim their lives were threatened. What's new? He did assure each family member that we will, we would and should expect change. What's needed now is not more stoking of fear and division. We need to bring law enforcement and communities closer together, not to drive them apart. Now the executive order stopped short in banning no-knock warrants. That is one of the demands from these ongoing protests. Ben Kennedy, CBN News. Thanks, Ben. Pat, we're in a moment where you can see a lot of movement on reforms. Oh, there's a movement of sorts, but the truth is the President of the United States can't order the states what to do. It has to come out of the states. This is a state matter, and uh, uh, these police work for municipalities. In turn, they're responsible to state governors, and unless the uh, reform goes all the way down the line, it won't have any effect. The President of the United States is not able to tell police departments what to do. Uh, he can give money to some of them for certain initiatives. That, that's one of the things. But uh, it, it's toothless unless, unless it's carried on by the states themselves. And again, when we talked to the senator yesterday, the whole idea of the, the Police Protective Association <laughs> Uh, means that the police will be fighting, the police union will be fighting certain reforms. But there needs to be a national database of these cops that have been uh, mistreating, uh, mistreating the people, those with mental problems, those that are inadequately trained, etc. And uh, they, they need to be weeded out. I mean, just say, look, the, you get to fire these people. But the President of the United States, unfortunately, isn't able to do that. Now, there's something else that's coming up, too. Uh, there's a tremendous feeling in the courts of America that they do not suppress uh, the right to publish. Uh, the Pentagon Papers were an example of that. But now the president says John Bolton is saying things that ought to be repressed. And so he's thinking of bringing a civil suit against John Bolton. And 
John, you can tell us more about that. That is right, Pat. The Justice Department is filing a civil lawsuit to halt the release of John Bolton's upcoming book, accusing President Trump's former national security advisor of failing to properly vet the transcript for classified information. Bolton's publisher says that's not true. Rather, the administration is trying to block a book that's viewed as unfavorable to the president. Well, a potential breakthrough in the treatment for COVID-19. Doctors at Oxford University in the United Kingdom say a common steroid improves survival rates in the sickest patients, raising recovery prospects for people on ventilators by a third. When somebody comes off a ventilator, do they come off the ventilator dead or alive? And we've improved their chances of coming off that ventilator alive. The drug is called dexamethasone, and PAT hospitals in the United Kingdom are already using it as part of their COVID treatment. Dexamethadone. We're learning all kinds of fancy names. <laughs> CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson is joining us now. Lori, it's good to see you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Pat. Hey, how does this dexamethadone work? Why is it such a big deal? Pretty good, pretty good. You got that down. Uh, it's a steroid, and it's really fantastic for people who are at death's door, for the sickest of the sick, people who are on ventilators. These are the machines in the hospital that breathe for us. It reduced the death rate of people on vents by a third. That's huge. And then also for people who are receiving oxygen to help them breathe, reduced their death rate by a fifth. But also, Pat, really didn't show benefit for anyone else for people with milder cases. So folks who have access to this or other steroids should really not use that for a more mild case of COVID because the literature shows that sometimes steroids can actually prolong the duration of COVID-19. So if you have a steroid, talk to your doctor about it. This particular steroid is very common and very cheap. It's only eight bucks for a pill and it's also given in uh, IV form. And what it does is it's an anti-inflammatory and, and calms down that cytokine storm that we know has been killing so many COVID-19 patients. That's when your immune system tries to attack the COVID uh, virus, but just kind of goes crazy into overdrive and starts attacking your own organs and ends up killing you. And so that's what this helps prevent. And even though uh, this study was in the UK and it's now being standard of care in the UK, doctors here in America have been using it for COVID patients off label. Uh, Lori, how we far we along toward a vaccine? People have been working on it. Are we any closer? Well, we know that uh, a lot of health officials on the COVID task force and others have been saying a vaccine could be available to the public as early as this fall. We know that there are 70 vaccines in development right now. Ten of them are being tested on people. You know that that's a very long process. You have to first check to make sure that it's safe and then also make sure that it works in small groups of people and then very large groups of people. And then once the vaccine has been approved, it usually take six months to make enough doses and get it out to all the doctor's offices. So what they're doing right now is they're looking at some of the leading contenders and already starting to mass produce it so that when these are produced, when these are approved, that they'll be ready to go. Hopefully by the end of the year, we could see hundreds of millions of doses by the end of this year, the beginning of next year. That's what the goal is. That's incredible good news. I'm, I tell you, that thing has been just destroying our economy and destroying the lives of people. Hey, by the way, it, it looks like that wet market in Wuhan was the source of this uh, COVID thing. Now it looks like it's a little flyer of the, of the virus in China. Can you tell us about that? That's right. For a couple of months in Beijing, there have been no reports of any new cases. And now they're looking at about 150 new cases, according to the Chinese Communist government. And they're saying that this new flare up started in a market. And so they're not letting any air traffic in and out of Beijing. They've cut air flights, 1,200 flights, 60%. They've shut down the schools, the movie theaters, and a lot of these neighborhoods around that giant market are um, on lockdown as well. So they're really trying to tamp down that most recent flare up in Beijing. Well, I hope they can do it. By the way, it's considered uh, not uh, politically correct to call this thing a Chinese virus, but it came out of China from the wet market. They, they were uh, mingling uh, wild animals with domestic animals, and there was no sanitation whatsoever. 
Wendy, uh, thank you very much, Lori. My pleasure. It. Thanks for having me. All right, Wendy, what's thanks? All right, coming up, leveling the playing field. These girls are fed up with being forced to compete with boys. They're losing in sporting events. Can they win in the courtroom? And later, a baffling illness. A rash engulfed his whole body with pain in his heart and shooting down his arm. What was wrong with this four-year-old? And why did his mother fear he would die? A gentleman from Jamaica named Usain Bolt was considered the fastest man uh, on earth. He ran the hundred in, in record times. But can you imagine you're a girl and you've got to compete against him? Yeah. Well, you'd say, there's no way. I can't do it. Well, some of these male athletes wanted to be girls. So they had all those hormone shots and some of this... Uh, uh, medical attention. I'm not sure how far they went. But nevertheless, they're now saying, well, we are women. We're not men anymore. Well, the bolts of this world <laughs> are, are beating girls, of course. And just imagine how a female track star feels when suddenly she has to compete with a man that's considered as calling himself a transgender. Well, that's what happened to Chelsea Mitchell. And it cost her four state championships. Hmm. Chelsea has said, I've had enough. I'm fed up with this. So now she and other female athletes in the state of Connecticut are fighting back. How is she doing it? With a federal lawsuit. Caitlin Burke has their amazing story. The first time I competed against a transgender athlete was in my freshman year at the state open meet. Um, and it was really just, conf it was confusing. That confusion grew into frustration as Chelsea Mitchell had to compete against biological males her entire high school track career. Now a graduating senior, she's come up short in four state championship events. There's been a lot of feelings, you know, whenever I race against these uh, biological males that I, no matter how hard I try, like I'm not going to win and we line up knowing we're going to lose. It seems like a no brainer. Biological males compete against biological males. Biological females compete against biological females. But several years ago, the CIAC, or the Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference, adopted a policy that allows anyone who identifies as female to compete in girls' athletic events. After years with this as the reality, Mitchell and two other athletes are fighting back. I'm hoping for my sport to be fair again because it's something that we all love to do. And when it's not fair, it's not as fun because you know that all your hard work isn't really paying off. Alana Smith joined Chelsea and a third athlete, Selena Sewell, to take action. Represented by Alliance Defending Freedom, they filed a complaint with the Education Department's Office for Civil Rights. They received a decision in their favor that allowing transgender females to compete in girls' sports is illegal. The three also filed a federal lawsuit challenging their state's policy. Their attorney argues that forcing girls to become spectators in their own sports completely goes against Title IX, the 1972 federal law creating equal opportunities for women. Athletic policies like the ones that we're seeing in the state of Connecticut really violate Title IX and undermine nearly 50 years of advances for women. We essentially have male sports and co-ed sports in the state of Connecticut. The Justice Department recently joined the discussion, filing a statement of interest in the case, underscoring that Title IX protects on the basis of biological sex. We all know both from science and common sense that males are generally bigger, faster, and stronger than comparably fit and trained female athletes. Connecticut's athletic body says its policy complies with a state law barring schools from discriminating against transgender students. Lawyers for the two transgender athletes at the center of this case argue since both of their clients are undergoing hormone treatments, it puts them on a level playing field with those they compete against. No amount of um, cross-sex hormones or hormone blockers and things of that nature can really undo the physiological advantages that biological males have, whether that's in their 
larger hearts and lung capacity and denser bones and stronger muscles. Connecticut, 17 other states, and the District of Columbia allow transgender high school athletes to compete without restrictions. Idaho recently became the first state to ban transgender athletes from competing in women's sports. The ACLU quickly sued, challenging that legislation. ADF attorneys are working to get that lawsuit dismissed. Meanwhile, back in Connecticut, just before COVID brought an early end to the spring track season, Chelsea won the state championship in the 55-meter dash, defeating a transgender competitor. To kind of be in the same race as the, the athlete who has beaten me so many times and took those titles away from me, to be able to finally like win was just an amazing feeling. Her attorney, however, stresses this does not make up for the unfairness faced by Chelsea and other female athletes over the last four years. It also, too, doesn't undo the fact that even though Chelsea might have won, there are a number of other young female athletes who placed beneath the male, the biological male, in those placements, and they were bumped down to positions they didn't deserve. When these three athletes and their families decided to come forward and fight, they expected pushback. Chelsea's mom, Christy, says they've actually seen the opposite. Other parents have been just very supportive and grateful. Um, often they will come up to us at meets and thank us for having spoken out. Um, you know, so a lot of people are worried to speak out. They're worried about backlash or that, um, you know, they will be judged by taking the stand. And we haven't, we haven't had that. The federal lawsuit remains in the early stages, but ADF is hopeful. They're requesting that transgender athletes be banned from competing in girls sports in Connecticut and that all records set by them be erased. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, New Haven, Connecticut. Thanks, Caitlin. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, your doctors are allowing young children to say, well, I want to be a girl, I want to be a boy, I want to be something different than I am. And these kids don't even know who they are, and yet their parents are allowing them to get to this incredible procedure where their sex organs are often surgically removed, where they're given hormones to change their identity. I mean, this thing is just insane, and it's spread so far. And now, of course, the Supreme Court is coming in and saying, well, we've got to give these uh, uh, people uh, constitutional uh, freedom. Our society has just gone out of control, and that's just one of the more things that you say, God Almighty, how long is this going to go on? What I can't understand is that, say you're that transgender male that's running against these girls. What kind of victory is that for you? I mean, yeah. you just beat a bunch of girls. That's right. It's so big so deal. Big, <laughs> yeah. So big deal. You know, I, I ran track against Did other you? other girls, and it was hard enough with the girls. Oh, sure. I can't imagine having to do that. Well, um, I imagine somebody like that Bolt who's an incredible in exactly. the, the sprint against. I mean, this guy is fabulous. I'm very excited for this yeah, lawsuit. Well, I think know. they're going to win. They'll win, but who knows? I mean, the Supreme Court, you never know what they're going to do anymore because the law doesn't have any meaning. The, the, the words of the Constitution don't have meaning. The words of statutes don't have meaning anymore. Uh, this thing, these documents have become so fluid that it's whatever a group of judges at any given point of time feels is the uh, mood of the people. Wendy. All right, still ahead, a drug lord's last stand. This New York City kingpin was trafficking millions of dollars worth of coke. What took him down? And up next, fighting against the gates of hell. That's how one mother felt when her son was struggling to stay alive. Doctors had no clue what was wrong. So where does she turn for help? You're about to find out. Plus, we'll be praying for you, so don't go away. Well, Noah Stoltz was just four years old when his body broke out in a raging rash. Soon, Noah's face was swollen beyond recognition. Well, what was wrong with him? Doctors had no idea, but they did one thing, and they don't get him stable. Soon, Noah would die. 
The thought of losing Noah was one of the most terrifying things I've ever walked through. But I knew that if I was losing him in the hands of Jesus, that's the safest place for him to be. As an infant, Noah Stoltz had several ear and viral infections. His parents, Lindsay and Dalton, grew concerned. He kept getting sick with a lot of viruses, ear infections, over and over. So our pediatrician recommended that we get his immune system tested. And that was the first time that we found out that Noah indeed had an immune deficiency and that viruses that he was catching, he never built immunity up to. So he kept catching the same things over and over. I just remember uh, my wife coming to me at different times. She's like, do you think he's ever going to get better? Like, is this ever going to change? As he grew, Noah continued to struggle with numerous health issues, and doctors failed to find answers. At age four, a new test on his immune system was ordered, and the results showed it was fine. Doctors then told Lindsay it could be something worse. I remember the day that she called and said his immune system was perfect. I had known that our options were his immune system or an autoimmune disease, which there's not a cure for, or cancer. And so when she rolled out his immune system, I remember the day I picked him up from preschool that day and I just watched him through the window for a while and just tried to gather myself because I knew something was seriously wrong with him and it was worse than we had thought. One night as I was tucking him in bed, he looked at me and he said, Mom, you know you can't make me better. And he said it so matter-of-factly. And I said, I know, but I'm just trying to help. And he said, only God can make me better. I didn't know what he was saying, and I feared losing him on a regular basis just because I didn't know what was going on with him. So the peace that he had, that he was going to get better, also caused a lot more fear in me somehow that I, he needed help right away. The Lord had really given me peace. So we continue just to fix our heart, our minds on Jesus. I really believe uh, that the Lord's going to heal our son, but I told her I believe it's going to get much worse uh, before it gets better. The only thing I knew how to do uh, was to, to pray and then as well just to be a source of encouragement. He came home one day from school and he was having a lot of pain in his heart, down his arm, and he started breaking out in what looked like hives or rashing on his torso. And so I was watching him really carefully and I called his doctor and they said give him Benadryl and see if it settles. If it doesn't, he needs to come to the ER right away. Noah did not improve and was taken to the hospital and admitted to the ER. He just spiraled out of control very quickly. It really was the grace of God that we went to the hospital that night. The rashing that had been on his torso spread over his entire body and even his face was swelling and he began to throw up violently. And they said, if we don't get him stable, we're in big trouble. So our number one priority is to get him stable. If I didn't know that that was my son, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recognize him. That's a place that uh, I wouldn't wish on for anyone. And I remember crying out to God saying, I feel like the very gates of hell have come against my child. Like, look at him. And I just felt the Holy Spirit saying, I know what that feels like. Because his son really had come against the gates of hell and overcome. And so there was peace in that, that there was nothing we were about to walk through that he couldn't relate with. We believe in the power of prayer, and we believe that God hears our prayers. And so as we were crying out to God in desperate prayer, um, I, just, I was having hope that God was going to do something and do uh, what only He is able to do. We enlisted an army of people to pray alongside us, to pray for us, to pray with us. And, and I know that people were interceding uh, before the Father right along with us. The doctor came in and he said, I I can tell you everything that's off on his blood work. I cannot tell you why. He's not consistent with anything that we've dealt with before. The doctor had said, if he does not eat this morning, we're gonna have to put in a feeding tube. And that morning he woke up and he asked for a cracker, and then another, and then another, and all of a sudden he was eating again. Slowly each day, Noah was actually getting stronger. And there was an army of people and friends praying for him. So now they were trying to figure out, okay, he's stable. What just happened? By the fifth day in the hospital, Noah had fully recovered with no explanation from the doctors. The Stoltz family points to the power of prayer for their son's healing. We were so overjoyed that Noah was recovering and so rapidly. In fact, the doctor said, I've never seen a patient deteriorate so quickly and rebound so quickly. That season, those five days in the hospital, 
was just a constant battle just to remember the truth of who God is and to not doubt Him in the middle of the storm. I marvel at what God's done in Noah every single day. And it is a picture of Jesus because to this day, I can't tell Him what happened to Him. No one knows what happened to Him. So I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God healed Him. My name is Noah. Hey everybody. I got sick and my, my skin was turning blue. Then I was at the hospital for five days and then God healed me. I just have seen God's hand of faithfulness and provision and healing in Noah's life that has taught us so much just that he can be trusted and things don't always go the way that you desire for them to go, but God is with you in the midst of it. Only God can do such a miracle. Now, here's some other good news. Bernice, who lives in uh, Tulaton, Oregon. I'm not yeah. heard of that town. Tulaton. His doctor diagnosed with glaucoma and cataracts. It wasn't bad enough. She had sand and gravel tape feeling in her eyes. And one day, Bernice was watching our program and she heard Wendy say, somebody you've been having trouble with your eyes. Your vision is getting increasing worse. Put your head on your eyes. God's touching your vision. And guess what? By faith, Bernice believed the word. She now sees clearly. Her birthday was the next day, so she considered a wonderful birthday present. Wendy. Praise God. All right. When uh, Felice, a doctor in Murrieta, Murrieta, California, started seeing unexplained bleeding, she became deeply concerned. While watching the 700 Club on June the 3rd, she was pr surprised when you prayed, Pat, and you said, someone, you have a growth on your uterus and you were experiencing unexpected bleeding. Right now, just put your hand on your stomach you are healed. By faith, Felice believed and has not had any bleeding since. Praise well, God. Well, you didn't know Bernice, and I didn't know... Felice. Felice. <laughs> <laughs> but God knew them both. Yes. Folks, we want to pray for you now. With God, all things are possible. I'm just astounded at the glory of God, of what He can do. So whatever's in your mind, you say, well, yeah, but He can't heal me. Yes, He can. If He made you, He can fix you. And not only healing, but He can take care of your financial needs, your problem with your family, all these things. God is able. Now, we're going to join hands together. We're going to believe God for you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we hold before you the people who are watching this program and their loved ones. Lord, hear their prayers. They're crying out to you now. And we believe God with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Now, Wendy, you have a... Yeah, there's someone, you're on your knees in front of the TV. You're saying, Lord, fix me. And there's so many things going on in your body that you're not saying anything in particular, but God knows uh, because there's a number of things that, that God needs to fix. And as Pat said, God can, He made you, He can fix you. So, Lord, touch this person right now who's calling out to you for all of these different uh, illnesses. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Somebody has a bleeding ulcer. It's that E. pylori uh, virus, and the Lord is burning it out right now out of your uh, intestine, out of your, your inner being, and you are completely healed. Those ulcers are healed. Yeah, there's someone with a rash all over your body, just like you saw that. It was similar to the way that it looked on that little boy that we just saw the story of. and. Uh, and it's also unexplained. The doctors don't know what it is, but the Lord is touching you right now, and that rash is leaving in Jesus' name. Thank you. Because somebody, I believe the name is Norman, and you've got an infection in your knee. There's a, there's a, a virus in there that somehow there's been an operation or something has happened, and, and uh, you've you got an infection. Right now, place your hand on that knee. The Lord is healing it in Jesus' name. Touch. Wendy, one more. There's a lady with some unexplained nerve damage in your face, and uh, it's just causing a lot of distress, and, and God's touching you right now. You're being healed. And for Jesus others in this audience who are crying out to God, your family problems, for example, you, you, you're having trouble with your spouse and your children, and you say, God, I give them to you right now, and Lord, heal this family, heal these relationships, and may there be love where there has been hate. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Let us hear from you. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to pray for you. We've got people on the phones all around, and they, they're at the telephones. And the numbers 
Well, it's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. And uh, if you uh, want to give us a testimony of what God done in your life, I'd love to hear that. So just pick up the phone, 1-800-700-7000. And if somebody's on the phone, they'll be glad to hear from you. Wendy? Still ahead, the cocaine kingpin. He dealt drugs up and down the eastern shore, and after he got busted, he said he'd rather kill himself than go to prison. So what happened next? You'll see, don't go away. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell testified before Congress Tuesday on the economic outlook, saying there's no telling how long the current downturn will last, and every day it continues, the economy suffers more damage. He promised, however, that the Fed will do everything it can to help lessen the blow. Meanwhile, some good news on the retail front. Newly released numbers show sales jumped 17.7% from April to May, the bounce back coming as more businesses begin to reopen. However, that number is down more than 6% compared to this time last year. Well, despite the bad economy, Americans intend to keep giving their money to charities. An April survey of 630 U.S. donors showed 80% plan to uh, keep making donations because they're optimistic the economy will recover quickly. That's on top of New Giving USA report that shows an increase in giving throughout 2019. Americans gave nearly $450 billion last year. That's a 2.4% rise over 2016. 70% of those donations made by individuals. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Herman Mendoza felt invincible, and he had a good reason. He worked his way up from a street corner drug dealer to become a cocaine kingpin. But as Herman was rapidly rising to the top, the feds were slowly closing in. In his early 20s, Herman Mendoza made his fortune selling cocaine along the eastern seaboard. Herman's kingdom crumbled when he was arrested and faced life in prison. It was there that Herman came face to face with the love of God. He knew he would never be the same. In his book, Shifting Shadows, Herman shares his story, showing how far God will go to bring a troubled soul home. Herman Mendoza joins us now for the rest of the story, and we welcome you to the 700 Club via Skype, Herman. Thank you for having me. Well, you started dealing drugs at a very young age, when, how, how old were you, and why did you start? Uh, I started at, at the age of 13, pretty much. Uh, I got sort of involved with uh, the trend at the time. People were involved in the sales of narcotics, and I started to consume drugs and sort of hooked, got hooked into uh, consuming drugs. And so I was doing it more to sustain the habit. And then eventually uh, got arrested uh, as a young person, 13, 14 years old, and uh, my later uh, years, uh, 21, was when I was uh, involved again in the sales of narcotics with my brothers, uh, distributing hundreds of kilos of cocaine. Um, and I was unemployed at the time, and I didn't want to go back into that kind of lifestyle, knowing the fact that it had destroyed me as a juvenile. But I was unemployed, and I thought, hey, fast money, quick, I can make a quick buck, and eventually got arrested. Yeah, I was reading that you were actually counting your brother's money and it was like over a million dollars and you were like, I want some of that. Exactly. I mean, I saw $1.2 million in cash. I was only 21 years old and seeing that kind of money kind of lured me back into this kind of business and uh, got so hooked on it. I thought I was on top of the world. I had so much money, party life, thinking that would sustain me, uh, you know, give me the kind of pleasures I was uh, looking after and eventually led me down a road of destruction and, and prison. Herman, you were arrested in a drug bust so big it made the papers in New York. What happened? Yeah, so I got arrested uh, uh, with 31 kilos of cocaine. Um, and my car was pulled over by the police that were, were under investigation. 
And uh, when they sent me uh, to the prison, I remember the next day I picked up the newspaper and it said uh, two brothers busted with $3.8 million of cocaine facing life in prison. And at that point, I was just so distraught. I was like, wow, I'm really facing life in prison as a young man. And uh, but I was still not really, you know, uh, giving my life to the Lord or thinking about God. I was really thinking about my situation at the time and eventually uh, got sentenced um, three to nine years of incarceration. We worked out with my attorneys and uh, the prosecutor went to a program called Shock and then went to a chapel at that same day uh, and said, if, uh, Lord, if you allow me to get out of prison, I promise you I would not drink alcohol for six months. I mean, what kind of petition was that? I was, it, it was just ignorance on my part. And eventually was released uh, after serving that uh, time in that particular uh, military camp. And uh, as the scripture says in uh, Proverbs 26, 11, as a dog returns to his vomit, so fools return to their folly. And that's what I did. I went right back after six months to celebrate my sobriety uh, and started to drink and went right back into the business of distribution of cocaine and eventually got arrested again uh, on a federal level. All right. So you vowed that you'd it, when you got arrested again, you vowed that you'd rather take your own life than go to prison. What happened? Exactly. So eventually I, I decided to go home one day after uh, drinking and partying and I wanted to see my family. And so when I got to my home, the cops obviously were surrounding the property. And the very next day, uh, they contacted my wife and they said, look, we're, we have the house surrounded. Tell your husband to give himself in. And the very first reaction was to jump out the window. Uh, and when I seen all the cops, state police, uh, DEA agents, mm. uh, marshals, I said, I told my wife, my life is over. Open the door. And so as they hauled me into the adjacent car there uh, on the way to the prison, I told the marshals, I want to end my life right here. It is worth nothing because uh, I was confronting a lot of time in prison. Little did I know that my brother that got arrested with me had given his life to the Lord and was praying that God would send me to the same facility and same prison cell so he can preach the gospel to me. That's amazing because the chances were slim, but you ended up in the same prison right there with your brother and you became a Christian. And I became a Christian. He shared the gospel with me. And uh, I just felt that my life was just void at the time. I was looking for answers, trying to find uh, solace, trying to find the peace that the scripture so describes. And I went to the chapel uh, and, uh, and the sermon was pretty much for me mm -hmm. and saying that there's a person in here that's so broken, looking for answers, had tried everything, money, uh, woman, uh, party life. And I knew it was for me. He says, look, you can receive Jesus and have your life fulfilled. Yeah. And I went up to the altar and I extended my hands and I said, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And God saved me right there in that prison chapel. And my life was just, you know, I felt this warmth that enveloped me. I felt convicted of the sins that I've done in the past. And I, want, I wanted to make amends with the people that I hurt. And, uh, you know, I, I, saw, I sort of saw like a vision of the people that I was spewing drugs to and hurting, and perhaps women that were selling their bodies to consume the very drugs that I was selling, and people that were killing, you know, for, for drugs. And I wanted to make things right, so I contacted my mother and said I was sorry that I was, I was born again, that I was a Christian. Mm. She didn't know about this new conversion, uh, but uh, she was so happy for She's me. Happy. And I, well, and Herman, my life was just uh, I just want to point out that you were sentenced to a fraction of the time that you were originally facing. Uh, since then, you've been out, you've been preaching, you and your wife are in ministry together, and you have written ab about it in your book called Shifting Shadows. This is an incredible story, an incredible book, incredible testimony of an incredible life. Herman, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story. Thank you for having me on. God All bless. All right, God bless you. And of course, it's available wherever books are what sold. What an amazing guy, a remarkable story, a nice young man. Exactly. Well, after the coronavirus hit, Kim lost her job. She had no money coming in and food was running short. She was afraid she and her children were going to starve to death. Kim is a single mom who did laundry in people's homes to provide for her three sons. Then COVID-19 came to Myanmar. I am afraid of the virus. 
I do not know how to protect my children. All I have is harsh laundry soap to wash their hands. It hurts our skin. Because of the pandemic, Ken has not been able to do laundry for any of her clients. It has been many weeks since I had a job or income. How long can we last? Now, I'm afraid my children will starve. I cry a lot about that. Finally, they ran out of food. I begged my neighbors for help. They felt sorry for us and gave us a little rice and fruit. Then CBN's Operation Blessing came to Kin's community. We brought a grocery box filled with bags of rice, beans, vitamins, and soap. Everyone washed up and got ready to eat. I feel like I can breathe again. Now, I don't have to worry about food. I am very grateful for Operation Blessing. All around the world, Operation Blessing is helping people just like Ken in Myanmar. Myanmar. It used to be called Burma. Myanmar, Burma, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. And all around the world. And how do you do it? How are we doing it? Well, we're doing it because you are our partners. And what we're talking about, the 700 Club, it's just 65 cents a day. It's $20 a month. And you can be a 700 Club member. And as a gift, we have a thing called Do You Need a Miracle? And it's real stories of God at work. There's some marvelous stories. You'll be thrilled when you have a chance to hear what God has done. You know, if you can understand God, if you come to God, you must believe that He is and He's a reward of them that, that seek Him. And you learn about these testimonies and it builds your faith. So we'll send this to you as our gift, but we ask you to join the 700 Club. $20 a month. So pick up the phone, call in 1-800-700-7000. Okay. All right. We have got some email right, questions so. for you. But first, uh, next Wednesday on June 24th, we'll have a special edition of the 700 Club featuring your voicemail questions for Pat. So if you have a question that's burning that you'd just love to ask Pat, call the number on your screen, 1-800-677-7884. Call today only from right now until 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Save you all day to leave your voicemail question for Pat. Again, that special number is 800-677-7884. Call and leave your voicemail question, and Pat will be answering them next Wednesday, June 24th, right here on the 700 Club. That's a fun show, so be, be sure you get your questions. Yes, it's it is. All right. All right, we got some questions for you right now. Carol says, hello, Pat. My mom is 86 years old and is now bedridden due to the result of a surgical procedure. She's been asking me if God has been punishing her for her circumstances. Can you assure her that her suffering has nothing to do with God punishing her? My family would be forever grateful. Well, I, I just want to say right now that uh, uh, God knows you and Regrettably, whether you like it or not, I'm 90, but you're 86, and, and we get a little older. And when we do, our, our, these bodies we have start to break down. It isn't God's punishment. It's the way he, uh, we have a pineal gland that after a while says, you're not worth much, and I'm going to turn you off. And when that thing f flips on you, you start getting old. And uh, so I, I just want you to say God loves you, and he will carry you. From the time you were born to the time you die, He will be there with you. So don't don't be condemning yourself. Just rejoice in the things of the Lord, all right? Amen. Jan says, will little kids go in the rapture? My friends keep telling me that they won't and that they will have to go through the tribulation. She also believes grace is no longer with us after the rapture. Is that true? Uh, there's more bad teaching about this whole rapture business uh, it came out of an Irving Eight meeting. Some 17-year-old uh, girl started talking about this stuff, and it was picked up by John Nelson Darby and then Schofield. Look, here's what the Bible says. Get this very clearly. The Lord himself is going to come with a shout of command, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four corners of the earth, and they will forever be with the Lord. They will meet him in the air. So when he comes back, Bang! That's the rapture. There's not going to be some secret slipping away seven years and then a tribulation and all this business. 
the Bible says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and he will send out his angels. Immediately after the tribulation. So whatever is going to happen, is some bad stuff going to happen on the earth. But when it does, lift up your eyes, for your redemption draws near. So that, that's what's happening. And, and all this other stuff about kids not going in the rapture and they're that's all baloney. I mean, don't listen to it. I mean, it, the Lord's made it very clear. He's re read the Bible. Read what it says in Matthew. It's all laid out. All right. <laughs> Amen. Okay. All right. Gloria says, since the murder of Mr. George Floyd, um, there's a lot of talk of going on about racism. What is the meaning of racism? I looked up the definition in the dictionary, and I've been called a racist just because I have white skin. It does not matter what I think or feel. I am in my 80s and have never thought I was better than anyone of any race. This is very hurtful. Well, uh, the idea of, of race is that uh, you think, of course, you're white, you have a privilege over somebody who's uh, uh, Mexican or, or, you know, I've begun to realize we're all one race and, and I, I meet these Hispanics, they're my brothers and sisters. I meet black people, they're my brothers and sisters. I have them involved. We have 23% of the students at Regent University are African American. About 8% are Hispanic. These are our brothers and sisters in the Lord, whether they're Chinese or Japanese or, or Indian or whoever they are. You go with these people and you realize we're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen. And we're all one family. And that's, you know, not one race is any better than any other. We're all one in Christ. Well, we leave it with these words from Proverbs. The name of the Lord is a strong tower for Wendy and all of us. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.